Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening. The King Faisal Center for Research in Islamic Studies is delighted to partner with Dar al Uloom University. Tonight, we launch our first joint event. Through this partnership, we aim to strengthen the ties of research and scientific cooperation between the two entities. And we hope that this is the first of many of joint efforts between the two entities. Tonight's webinar is entitled, is titled The Effect of COVID-19 on Social Life in Riyadh. In January 2021, His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman revealed a plan to make Riyadh one of the largest city economies in the world, increasing its residents from 7.5 million to 20 million in 2030. Building on Vision 2030's three main themes, of a vibrant society, a thriving economy, and an ambitious nation, Riyadh is positioned as the launching point for innovation, industry, tourism, education, jobs, and more for the kingdom. No doubt, Riyadh is already a major city and currently one of the top 40 cities in the world and is only set to grow. Only this past week, the Festival of Light launched in Riyadh putting the work of more than 60 international and Saudi artists work on display from visual arts to interactive activities, sculptures, cinematic shows, educational workshops and music shows, all under the hopeful theme of under the sky, looking toward a post pandemic world. Indeed, nothing can ruin plans like a global pandemic. 2020 kicked off a hopeful and exciting year for the kingdom. Hosting the G20 was seen as a chance to showcase the kingdom's efforts and to share entertainment venues and historical sites and tourism sites with many Saudi, that the many Saudis have embraced over the past years with the rest of the world. Tourism was picking up, but the pandemic halted global mobility. In many ways, the implications for Riyadh are both universal and highly contextual. We wonder by looking at the global pandemic and the global response to it, how governments and cities regulate the use of public spaces, who defines risk and what can be done to mitigate it. Saudi Arabia's response to the pandemic has been recognized as a success story. Building on their experience dealing with the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, Saudi Arabia proved ready. Borders were rapidly and quickly closed and heavy fines were imposed for breaking curfew or flouting the rules. Citizens were mostly compliant and deaths have been relatively low, despite a recent spike in cases. At the same time, there are also several challenges. What do the responses to the pandemic due to the confidence of populations, the perception of threat. This urban multicultural and young city allows us to unpack many of these themes. Our esteemed pan panelists today will shed light on the response to COVID, the implications for the city's development and how urban spaces are designed for people. Tonight's discussion was initially inspired by the research of Dr. Hint Abdelmunam. Dr. Hint is an assistant professor in architecture uh, at Dar al-Ulum University. She is specialized in sustainable eco-building assessment methods in hot, dry climates. She has 26 years of experience in consulting for different companies and teaching at universities in courses on sustainable eco-building and assessment methods, environmental control, architecture, technical drawing, landscape, and urban design. She's published several studies in related areas and was awarded the Excellency in Scientific Research from the Postgraduate Research College in Dar al Ulum in 2019. Dr. Hind holds an MSc in Environmental Studies and a PhD in Architecture from the University of Khartoum. To discuss these themes that she raises further, we are also joined by Dr. Mark Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a Senior Research Fellow at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies he was appointed the head of socioeconomics unit in April 2020 and has been affiliated with the King Faisal Center for several years. Previously, Dr. Thompson was assistant professor of Middle East studies at the King Fahd University of Petroleum and Minerals. Before joining KFUPM in 2012, he taught at the Prince Sultan University and the Saudi Arabian National Guard School of Signals. 
He obtained his PhD from the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. And last but not least, we will also host Ms. Lei Adloyan. Ms. Lei is the head of the Center for Development of Urban Design and Planning of Saudi cities at the Development Authority's Support Office and the Ministry of Municipal and Rural Affairs. She consults on mega urban development projects in the region and is an advisor on the School of Architecture Advisory Board of Southern Illinois University. She is also principal of Blade Loyan Architects and has extensive experience working on design projects locally in Saudi Arabia and globally. She holds a Master of Architecture and a Master of Urban Design from Washington University in St. Louis. Before I hand over to Dr. Hint uh, to share her presentation, I would just like to ask you to please post any questions for any of our esteemed panelists in the Q&A feature uh, of Zoom uh, in order for us to direct your questions to the panelists. Dr. Hint, I will leave the floor to you. Uh, okay, uh, can you make and share, please? Salam alaikum. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, you present uh, very well. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mark uh, Simpson for giving me this opportunity uh, for uh, presenting my research uh, findings in this webinar. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Balqis Dakhistani, the Dean of Graduate uh, Studies and Research uh, in Dar al Ulum uh, University for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my research uh, title is The Effect of COVID-19 uh, on Academic Social Life in Riyadh City, with focus on outdoor environment presented by Dr. Hind Abdel Minhem, Assistant Professor in Architecture Program, College of Architecture, Engineering and Digital Design. The abstract on uh, 18 March 2020, the Global Health Organization announced that COVID-19 became a global pandemic. Uh, the Ministry of Health considered COVID-19 lockdown that extend uh, for four months after the period of uh, uh, restriction ended, people were supposed to, uh, to come back to their uh, normal social life. However, the lockdown has caused a psychological impact to people without them being aware of it. This research is aiming to study the effect of COVID-19 on social life in Riyadh City, mainly on three public activities, uh, shopping mall, the mosque and open space, interior space, and it is psychological uh, effect. The data was collected using the Google form software in addition, simulation computer program is used to study and develop the outdoor environment to find solutions. The results show that people are coming slowly to their social life during COVID-19, but still lead to the shopping mall and the mosque and open space. Recommendation, it is to apply the health procedures during this time in the three places uh, as specified. The key words for the research COVID-19 social life, the shopping mall, the mosque, the public space, design the interior space, and psychological impact. Research problem, although the unlock uh, of the COVID-19 during July, August uh, 2020, people are continuing to stay at home, others are coming slowly to the social life. This makes studying the impact of COVID-19 on the people's social life is becoming crucial, especially on the five main activities in shopping mall, uh, praying and the mosque, visiting the open space, managing their interior space and psychological effect. The research objective, the research uh, objective is to uh, record uh, the response uh, regarding the COVID-19 outlook on the social life activity, especially in the shopping mall and the mosque. They record the health procedures applied on those area to find solutions in shaping the design of interior and exterior space to find solutions for the psychological effect. Uh, the research hypothesis, uh, COVID-19 has uh, an uh, affecting our design for interior space, COVID-19 affecting designing the outdoor space, COVID-19 is affecting praying in the mosque, COVID-19 is affecting visiting the shopping mall, 
uh, and uh, number five, does, fi uh, does the COVID-19 has psychological impact uh, to people? Definitions of the social life, the part of person time spent doing enjoyable things with others, or life is uh, an e a notion of the difficult uh, definitions. We can say that it is about the extent uh, the activity of the organic being on the ability to born, develop, uh, reproduce, and social. On the other hand, uh, it is what to link to the society, community, for individual and share a common culture of interests. The main uh, focus point for the research, uh, health impact and design the interior, exterior spaces, will design the mosque, design the shopping mall, and psychological impact. The research methodology uh, first, uh, we use the Google form, uh, about uh, 30 uh, questions distributed to people. Uh, we copy the link and distribute it by email. Uh, then uh, we have uh, the research focus area. It is academic uh, area. Uh, at the first time, it was distributed to the public, but we have um, a limited uh, response from people uh, because of the COVID-19. Uh, now, on 2021, 20, uh, uh, the reviewers asked me to redistribute the survey again and limit a limitation uh, of the uh, sample. Uh, it was distributed to academia uh, in uh, uh, Dar al Alum University and uh, Prince Sultan University and Nura University, and also uh, to secondary school, uh, the third uh, class in secondary school, and for professionals. Uh, at the moment in time, uh, after uh, this step, uh, the this, uh, response is uh, 141 uh, over uh, 300. Uh, it is near to 50%, and the reviewer said it is uh, represented uh, samples. The limitation because uh, of the COVID-19. The responders uh, for the percentage, uh, we have uh, different ages. Uh, male and female from 10 to 20, about 25%, from 20 to 30, 28%, from 30 to 40, 26%, from 40 to 50, it is about uh, 16%, and 50 to 60, it's about 5%. The samples area, uh, focus area, academics, uh, students in secondary school and university, and professionals. The research plan, uh, we have five main focus area, the shopping mall and the mosque, uh, the interior space, ex uh, exterior space and psychological impact. Uh, the steps uh, pass uh, through distribute the survey uh, by Google form and analyzing uh, the result, discussion, uh, the result and conclusion. For the result uh, of the shopping mall, we have three main questions about the duration time and uh, uh, the psychological impact, and it is uh, healthy procedures. Uh, for the duration time, 7% uh, say that they visit the shopping mall uh, once per week, uh, 2.8, uh, three times, and 7% about twice uh, per week. 25% uh, uh, said never visit uh, the shopping mall during the COVID-19. When we ask them why you didn't uh, visit the shopping mall, 50% uh, uh, of the responders say that because they are afraid from coronavirus. Then they, about the health procedures, uh, the respond, uh, responders agreed that the shopping mall is applying the health procedures. As we can see on the right uh, side, uh, social distancing is applied and uh, testing for the temperature also in shopping mall, uh, most of the shopping malls uh, is applied and the caution and districts, uh, it is uh, on the front door. Also, we can say that uh, the sliding door, it is also, uh, it is good for uh, this situation because people cannot touch uh, the doors. Praying at the most also about the duration time, 8% uh, said once per week, 7% uh, twice per week, 3% uh, about three times, and 14% they said every day they visit the mosque. Uh, uh, here, 59% uh, they said never visit the mosque because of the COVID-19. Psychological impact, uh, when we ask them why you didn't uh, visit uh, the mosque, 55% uh, they agreed they are afraid from uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. 
And uh, about the applying of the health procedures, 87% uh, they agreed, yes, uh, there is a, a health procedures applied in the mosque. And uh, like uh, on these uh, photos, we can see that people applied uh, the social distancing and everyone bring uh, his uh, prayer, sijada, uh, with him. And also they wear the mask. Uh, in Al Kaaba, in Mecca, uh, we, we cannot visit uh, Mecca. Uh, like before, you have to use uh, the smart application to book uh, your place uh, and they will send you a message. Uh, you can visit Mecca on this time. So uh, people, they have to listen what the government said to them in Saudi Arabia uh, about uh, applying the health procedures uh, in the public spaces uh, like the shopping mall, the mosque and open space. For visiting the, uh, the park, also we have a question about the duration time. 29% uh, they said they visit the park uh, once per week, 4% uh, twice, 7% uh, three times, and 7.8% uh, uh, every day. 446 uh, they said never uh, visit the park because they are afraid from coronavirus. And when we ask them, uh, why? They said that uh, the health procedures, it is not applied uh, very well in the uh, outdoor space or on the park. 14% uh, they said uh, there is no uh, wearing of the mask. 12% they said there is no social distancing. 25% they said there is no checkpoint on the park. And 50% agreed that they are afraid from the coronavirus. Managing the interior space, most of people, they are managing their interior space. 83% uh, they agreed that they are managing the interior space. And we ask uh, what uh, you have uh, done in, uh, in your uh, space. They said uh, that 24% they said maximize the space. 18% uh, they add plants, 33% uh, they open the window for the natural ventilation. And 3% I need to manage uh, for sport. And uh, 3.5, I changed my apartment because someone is affected by the virus. Uh, people are practicing several activities uh, in their home because of the lockdown and after the lockdown uh, because of this uh, special situation. And this, uh, we have some response like um, reading about 43%, uh, walking 47%, uh, uh, dancing uh, 21 uh, percent and social media more than usual, 61 uh, percent. Watching uh, news about the coronavirus, 17 percent. Practicing sport, about 26. Publish uh, scientific uh, research, 11 percent. Publication uh, books, about 6 percent. Riding bicycle, uh, 30 percent. Uh, talking in the conference, virtual conferences, 23%, uh, playing video games, about 27, and teaching online, uh, 43, uh, visiting uh, the neighbors, about 19. And here, this is an open question. Uh, what do you feel about uh, the situation of uh, the COVID-19 in the future? Uh, one uh, right that uh, keep yourself, another right uh, is scared from the death. Uh, one, I think that the COVID-19 will disappear soon and uh, our life will uh, be better. Uh, our focus area on this research is the outdoor environment uh, because of my uh, specialization is architecture engineering about uh, the, uh, the committee of uh, research advised me to mix uh, one focus area of the five uh, areas I mentioned uh, at the first of uh, a slide. So I choose that uh, to focus on outdoor environment. This is Arauda Park at the middle of Riyadh. Uh, the area is about uh, 3,200 uh, 3, meters square. And there, uh, there is, are many activities you can practice in this um, uh, park, uh, like uh, walkability and uh, sitting. Uh, there is available sitting area with uh, social distancing. Uh, the grass also is offered for the families with uh, distancing. Uh, there's a kiosk for the coffees and uh, play yard uh, for the youth uh, people, a play yard also for the children. And also there is a mosque uh, near uh, the park. It's a very nice uh, place. 
Uh, second, we apply uh, the computer program to study uh, the relation between uh, the urban uh, surrounding the park and uh, the park itself, the features uh, inside. Uh, we study the temperature, uh, the humidity, and the solar. The photos uh, show that we have ex uh, exceed uh, solar radiation uh, at the middle of the park and the surrounding area. So I advise uh, here, my recommendation here to plant some trees uh, as a buffer zone between the buildings and uh, the park. This will minimize uh, the massive uh, temperature, uh, especially in the summer uh, days. Discussion and the conclusion uh, for the shopping mall. The shopping mall is applying uh, the health procedures by uh, testing the temperature near the front door, applying the social distancing, and everyone is uh, wearing uh, the mask. For the, uh, visiting the mosque, also the mosque is applying the health procedures by testing temperature near the front door, applying the social distancing and wear uh, the mask. There are other uh, restrictions uh, we can check uh, during uh, Ramadan. Uh, during this period of uh, coming Ramadan, uh, we can check this uh, on the internet. The research encouraged people to pray at mosque with applying the social distancing and wearing the mask or applying the health procedures. The interior space, uh, many people manage uh, their interior space uh, as uh, we record the result that some people uh, maximize the space and some people uh, they are planting uh, some uh, you know, plant inside the space and uh, someone uh, uh, open the window for uh, the cross ventilation. Uh, so we can enjoy our uh, our space uh, to bring some new furniture or uh, manage the color. Uh, so anything can make you please with your uh, place. Uh, interior space is better to be done during this uh, period of COVID-19. The outdoor space also uh, the recommendation to build up more trees for more shades uh, to attract people to visit the park, encourage people to practice walking every day, provide seats with social distancing. The research recommends to apply social distancing on grass, where checkpoint uh, should be provided in the park. Uh, the applying of the uh, smart uh, application Tawakkanat is uh, compulsory by the government, will apply uh, of the health uh, procedures uh, in the park to encourage people uh, to visit uh, the park uh, every week. For, uh, by the social, uh, psychological effect, uh, as we uh, discussed that, uh, people practice many activities in their home uh, during the COVID-19, uh, as we see in the figure, uh, practice uh, dancing or sporting, writing, uh, publishing, and uh, watching TV or movies. Uh, you can discover your hobbies and uh, recover them again during the period of COVID-19. For the conclusion, uh, people can visit uh, the park uh, by applying uh, the health procedures provided during the COVID-19 pandemic to apply a checkpoint uh, and health procedures such, uh, such as uh, personal temperature and using smart devices and wearing the mask. Apply the tawakkanna as uh, in Saudi Arabia, it is compulsory uh, in public spaces. Uh, encourage uh, children and youth to visit the park weekly. Uh, walking and practicing sport, uh, fresh air is required for them, uh, for health, uh, especially uh, during this period of COVID-19. Encourage people to use a bicycle inside the neighborhood apply a computer program software such as EVMED to study the environmental issues such as uh, temperature, humidity, the wind direction, and the solar provide solutions like plant, planting high trees uh, as a buffer zone between the buildings uh, and the park to reduce the massive uh, temperature. Use outdoor fans in summer to encourage uh, the walkability in Riyadh City health procedures should be applied to all visitors uh, of the park. 
the life will go uh, on, on and people should keep doing the positive activities and plan for their future family and children, encouraging people to visit a uh, shopping mall and uh, applying the health procedures. Also, we need uh, to encourage people to go outside and visiting the park also by applying the health procedures and the research encouraged people to visit the mosque regularly and uh, to be sure by applying the health procedures. Well, research recommends people to think positively and manage their time at home by practicing uh, their hobbies uh, like sports, reading and writing and others. Okay. Uh, finally, the research paper uh, has been submitted to Sustainability Journal and now uh, it is under review. Uh, the editorial board, uh, near, nearly it will be published, uh, inshallah. Acknowledgement, the research would like to acknowledge Dar al Uloom University, especially the Deanship of Graduated Studies and Research for funding this research and uh, King Faisal Research Center for Islamic Studies and Research for choosing my research and giving me this opportunity to discuss uh, my research in this webinar. Well, a special thanks to Dean Cat and Cat Arc Research Committee and to all audience attending this webinar. Thank you uh, all attendees uh, for uh, attending this uh, webinar. Dr. Hind Abdel Munim, and this is my email for future contact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hend. Um, I think you've raised some very interesting points and thank you for sharing your research with us. Uh, please do uh, put any questions for Dr. Hend in the Q&A. Um, and Dr. Hind will also post a link in the chat uh, for uh, the attendees to evaluate the presentation. Uh, we will come back with many questions. I have several for you already, uh, but until then, I will hand over to Dr. Mark uh, for his remarks. Salam alaikum. Um, good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Dr. Hannah for the introduction and thank you to Dr. Hind for your presentation. I'm going to follow on from Dr. Hind by discussing some of my research findings related to societal perceptions of social restrictions introduced by the authorities to mitigate the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. And obviously we're hearing a great deal about these at the moment here in the kingdom due to a recent rise in infections. <clears throat> so firstly, I'm going to provide some context for my talk. Now we know that from the outset of the pandemic, the Saudi government took the threat of the coronavirus very seriously, responding rapidly and robustly to slow its spread in the kingdom. And as Hannah mentioned before, this can be attributed to Saudi Arabia's experience in and after 2012 of fighting Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, as we call it, another coronavirus, as well, of, co as well, of course, as health precautions implemented yearly every for, for, for the Hajj. And both of these helped the authorities develop a level of preparedness to fight the coronavirus pandemic as it began to spread in Saudi Arabia. But whilst the Saudi government has won praise for its COVID-19 approach, how have Saudis, for example, residents of the expanding capital Riyadh, reacted to the sometimes severe restrictions imposed upon them? For example, the enforced stringent national curfew and the fact that Saudi nationals, of course, are still not allowed to travel outside the kingdom. Additionally, in February 21, <clears throat> certain social restrictions were reintroduced to counter what was perceived as a certain societal complacency vis-a-vis -vis the spread of the virus. Now, my talk highlights the success of the government's methods in dealing with the health crisis, but also sheds light on an indirect consequence of this success, namely a degree of societal complacency and the potential danger this poses, especially in highly populated urban areas such as Riyadh. Now, my talk conducted in Saudi Arabia throughout the pandemic, 
separate online surveys with a total of approximately 1,000 respondents from a variety of backgrounds. They first looked at the socioeconomic effect of the pandemic on the future of young Saudis. The second, the psychological impact of coronavirus on young Saudis. And the most recent, societal perceptions of the government's precautionary coronavirus measures and social restrictions here in Riyadh. And it's the latter that I will refer to most in my talk today. <clears throat> Moreover, since October 2020, I've also been able to conduct focus groups and individual interviews as part of this ongoing research project. Now, obviously, due to the time constraint, I can only touch on some of these topical issues, but we will have time for elaboration later in the question and answer. So just to provide some necessary background to this, <clears throat> once the national lockdown was lifted um, towards the end of May last year, for the remainder of 2020, life in Saudi Arabia um, returned to a degree of normalcy within the latter part of the year, low infection rates and coronavirus related fatalities in the single figures. Nonetheless, in response to the emergence of the UK variant, on 20th of December, the Saudi government announced that it was closing its borders to all international travel for initially at least a week, although a long-term travel ban was subsequently extended to certain countries. But due to an increase in coronavirus infections during January 2021, on the 4th of February, the Saudi government reintroduced certain social restrictions, including the closing of public places, such as restaurants, coffee shops, and gyms. And according to the health minister, Dr. Tafi Araya, reimposing wide restrictions was inevitable after the health ministry reported that the number of cases jumped throughout January, reaching approximately 400 cases a day kingdom-wide from around 100 at the beginning of the month. However, these restrictions were lifted on the 7th of March and life returned more or less to normal. And in this instance, it seemed to me that the Saudi government had paid close attention to the ramifications and dangers of delaying lockdown measures that we saw happen in some countries such as the United Kingdom. <clears throat> now to date, Saudi Arabia appears to have avoided the worst of the pandemic although the authorities understand very clearly that there is no room for complacency and regularly issue stern warnings to the kingdom's populace, pointing out that failure to abide by the coronavirus rules could, at the very worst, result in another national lockdown. Indeed, the health minister has taken the lead in announcing pandemic procedures and restrictions also frequently cautioning the population about the consequences of not adhering to coronavirus precautionary measures. And in fact, we have heard a lot of this in the last couple of days. As only this week, Saudi Arabia's public security department reminded the public to be vigilant as stricter measures rely on the public's adherence. And in a video published on the department's Twitter account with the hashtag, the decision is in your hands, the simple and straightforward video showed Saudi Arabia's empty streets and the image of the empty courtyard around Karnaka during last year's national lockdown. Furthermore, the, authority, the authorities reiterate frequently that they will impose large fines on anyone breaking the coronavirus rules as well as closing places such as restaurants and shops <clears throat> that contravene the rules or indeed become infected areas. Additionally, the public prosecution has also warned against producing and uploading videos or video clips to social media that violate coronavirus precautionary measures, stressing that perpetrators face jail time and significant fines. However, as in other countries, Many Saudis I have talked to have been concerned that some unofficial or individual sources, especially those active on social media platforms such as Twitter, have sometimes been guilty of scaremongering, with the result that unsubstantiated stories and rumours can increase public fears 
and at times undermine the government's coronavirus messaging. So I'll move on now <clears throat> to discussing societal perceptions of social restrictions. <clears throat> And it appears that by and large, Saudis have acknowledged the necessity of domestic social restrictions, the imposition of quarantines and curfews, as without these measures, the government would have struggled to preserve the health of both nationals and non-Saudi residents during and after the worst of the pandemic. And according to my focus groups and interviews, even if some people complained about the imposition or re-imposition of certain social restrictions, there was grudging recognition that this was necessary, given that some people seem to have become a bit too complacent. Indeed, according to a university lecturer here in Riyadh, in general, Saudis attribute the, the kingdom's low fatality rate to those stringent measures introduced by the government at the outset of the pandemic. <clears throat> in another interview, a Saudi economic uh, consultant who works in Riyadh, but was curfewed at home in Medina during the worst of the pandemic, observed before Ramadan 2020, that he, is actually, he was actually somewhat surprised by widespread public support for some of the government's very tough approaches in dealing with the pandemic. Yet in discussion with him, you know, he believed that the important question at that time was whether this was genuine backing the government's policies in tackling the outbreak, or if, as in other countries, this support was based on a rally around the flag moment. However, continued public support for the authorities' coronavirus approach, an awareness that Saudi Arabia has avoided the worst of the pandemic due to the government's fast response, suggests that whilst a rally around the flag sentiment played a part, widespread public support has transcended this and is in fact genuine. So to gauge um, attitudes towards the authorities' measures in combating coronavirus and trying to mitigate its negative impact, I conducted a survey as well as having focus groups and interviews talking about societal perceptions of the government's measures and the accompanying social restrictions here in Riyadh. And of course, you know, these issues are actually applicable to any major city, not just Riyadh, uh, whether that city is in the kingdom or indeed anywhere in the world. And especially, uh, as Dr. Hannah pointed out earlier on, a growing metropolis like Riyadh, which has a very large youthful population. Now, obviously, I'm very aware that sometimes the answers to these questions can be subjective. You know, for example, when they are based on the respondent's age, gender and locality, but I think they do provide a snapshot of perceptions. And as I have pointed out many times before, perceptions might not be based on fact, but they matter as they reflect what people are thinking. <clears throat> so firstly, I survey, surveyed opinions about which age group has taken the government's precautionary measures regarding coronavirus the most seriously. And I'm just going to share this with you. Uh, <coughs> I am sorry, I just want to. Oops. Um, whoops. I'm just sorry, I just. Uh, my apologies, something's gone missing. See if I can end it. Excuse me a second, I'm having a little bit of a technical problem here. I'm sorry, something seems to have happened to my internet. 
Hannah, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, apologies. I think something has just, just happened to my internet. Hang on. My apologies. Okay, let me just try to... Okay, share screen. Right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, there was, seemed to have been a temporary breaking of my internet there. My apologies for that, but it's come back now. Okay. Excellent. Okay, then. Yes, uh, yes, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Technology. Okay, so... Um, let's put the slideshow here. trying to get the slideshow to working. Do you see that now? Does it come up, Anna? We can see it. You could um, push the, um, the, on the top to the right of auto save. There's the slideshow uh, up to the right, to the right. One more. No, to the right. Yes. 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 Sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay. There we go. There we go. <laughs> my apologies for that. Sorry. My internet. Excellent. Off, no, we but... can see it perfectly yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. My internet cut off. So, so uh, as I said, so first, I, firstly, I served a opinions about which age group has taken the government's precautionary measures regarding coronavirus the most seriously. So, for example, wearing masks in public places, regular washing of hands, observing social distancing rules, and using Ministry of Health apps such as Tawakalna to enter public places such as shopping malls, restaurants and gyms. And for those of, of you joining us from outside Saudi Arabia this evening, uh, we use Tawa Kalna app to, to check in and out of certain public places these days. So for example, I use it at my gym <clears throat> and this ensures that the number of people present uh, does not exceed the maximum number permitted. So at my gym, which is actually a large one, it's 85 people at one given time. So here you can see that the results show that approximately 44% of my respondents believe that the 25 to 40 age group is the most responsible, followed by 22% for the 40 to 55 age group, then 14% for the 55 to 70, and finally only 12% for 15 to 25. And I'll come back to this last figure in a minute because I think this is quite interesting because I know that the majority or a, a large number of my respondents are actually young people themselves. So secondly, just move on from this. Mm -hmm. Oops. So secondly, um, oh, disappearing. Oh. Sorry, I've got a problem. So secondly, respondents were asked which Saudi social grouping they believe has been taking the government's precautionary coronavirus measures the most seriously. Now, approximately 22% of respondents believe men aged 31 and 50 are the most responsible, 19% for men between 18 to 30, followed by 17% for women aged 18 to 30, 14 for women between 30 and 50, 12% for men uh, over 50, and 7% for women over 50. And going back to the age group findings of only 12% for 15 to 25, you know, significantly for a country with very large numbers of young people, you know, the results of male teenagers were only 3% and female teenagers 1%. And I think this is interesting because, as I said, I know that the majority of my survey respondents were young themselves. So if these statistics reflect reality on the ground and teenagers are disregarding the government's advice and precautionary measures, then this should be a concern. Although it's known that young people are not as at risk from coronavirus as older generations, Nevertheless, the emergence of new variants and, de and developing scientific knowledge about how and who spreads the virus underscore the importance of educating teenagers and children about the dangers associated with virus transmission. After all, large family gatherings are commonplace. And for example, teenagers, whilst maybe displaying no symptoms themselves, could transmit the virus to their elderly relatives. Now, certainly this is yet another issue 
universal, but it is critical in the kingdom, given its demographics, where approximately 60% of the population is under 30 years of age. Moving on, um, when asked for their views about the government's precautionary measures, such as social restrictions that have been in place intermittently since the beginning of the pandemic, approximately 40% of respondents agreed completely with the measures, with a further 27 saying that they mostly agree with them precisely because they acknowledged that they were necessary. A further five point strict, yet conversely, conversely about two and a half percent think they were not strict enough and around four and a half consider the restrictions completely unnecessary. However, whilst 12 and a half percent of respondents agree with the restrict that the restrictions were necessary, they have reservations and they weren't always happy about some of these. For instance, um, it came out in focus groups as well, that some disagreed with the sort of one size fits all approach and felt that there should be more flexibility. <clears throat> and in fact, amongst younger Saudis, a lot of these reservations related to students on overseas scholarships and the problems that they continue to face and the disruption that this is causing to their education. And an additional 5.4% believe that the government should have implemented restrictions uh, that were more targeted according to city, district or region, rather than necessary blanket national ones. Although that said, we do know that, did, that, that this did actually happen in a number of places such as districts in Jeddah. Finally, um, respondents were asked in which region the population has been taking the government's coronavirus precautions the most seriously, in their opinion. And I, it's no surprise that given that most people live in the main urban areas of Riyadh, Jidda, and the Daman, Kobar, Dara, and Conurbation in the eastern province, you know, these top the table with very similar figures along with the holy cities of Makkah and Medina, where highly publicized and stringent measures were introduced to protect the health of the limited number of pilgrims. And in recent focus groups and uh, in conversation with individuals and interviews, another important question being asked by many people is whether certain sections of society or indeed individual people have become complacent due to the relatively low rate of coronavirus infections following the worst of the pandemic. And as I mentioned before, certainly, you know, the Saudi authorities have been successful in combating the virus in comparison to other countries. But there also seems to have been this sort of nagging fear that, you know, that, that, a certain, that complacency, if you like, could impact de detrimentally on the overall national health situation. <clears throat> so for instance, in January 21, a Saudi health expert here in Riyadh, you know, believed that some people had become complacent because it seems that the point of danger, if you like, had passed due to fatalities in single figures and decreasing infections. <clears throat> and in fact, as life returned to a degree of normalcy following the lifting of the national curfew, I think it was only natural maybe that some people, you know, sort of began to let down their guard a bit. But as this health expert pointed out, you know, it only takes one person infected with, for example, the English variant to respread the virus and push infections up again. In addition, in late 2020 and in early 21, when I took the focus groups, there was consensus amongst them that one of the major factors for the rise in January 2021 infections were social gatherings such as wedding parties, as these act as super spreader events and of course are normally held in wars. You know, this situation can be exacerbated but by the fact that these occasions can be quite large, notwithstanding the government's directives on the number of people permitted to gather in one place. Consequently, in discussion with more aware Riyadh residents, you know, they frequently express concern about these potentially super spreader social events. And unsurprisingly, they support, you know, the authorities' frequent warnings um, about the fact that social restrictions and possibly curfews can and will be reinstated if people fail to ab abide by the government's rulings. That said, um, a, a journalist here in Riyadh also 
pointed out that, you know, the public is often blamed for failing to comply with the government mandated protective measures such as limited social gatherings, wearing masks and social distancing when visiting public places such as mosques and shopping malls. Still, the journalists wondered if a lack of compliance might be the result of sometimes weak enforcement or inconsistent messaging by different authorities rather than outright disregard for the precautionary measures. And a businesswoman here in Riyadh agrees as well, saying that there have sometimes been inconsistencies and contradictions from different institutions in their approach to tackling the pandemic. So she says, on the one hand, since the national lockdown and curfew was lifted, the Ministry of Health has stressed the importance of adhering to the government's precautionary measures, such as social distancing, yet on the other, <coughs> other institutions are continuing to promote and sort of push social activities, which she believes can send contradictory messages to the general public. So it's a case of on the one hand, don't do this, but on the other hand, do that. And of course, I think that this is another universal issue as governments around the world have tried to balance healthcare priorities with critical economic ones. And I think we all understand how difficult this has been. So in conclusion, like the rest of the world, Saudi Arabia's 2020 and the first half of 2021 have been dominated by the coronavirus pandemic. Unlike some other countries, such as the USA and the UK to date, in my opinion, the Saudi authorities have handled the pandemic effectively, mainly by being ahead of the curve, and thus been able to maintain support for precautionary coronavirus measures. However, as previously mentioned, you know, a degree of societal complacency has caused some concern with justified fears that infections and fatalities could rise as a result. Furthermore, as we know, just before the holy month of Ramadan, coronavirus infection rates have unfortunately begun to rise again, although fatalities remain stable. And with Ramadan starting next week, you know, people, of course, are, yes, are preparing and thinking about the holy month. But the issue for the government is that at Iftar, breaking the fast in the evening is, is normally a time of large social gatherings, followed by everyone out and about around Riyadh. And in normal times, the restaurants, the cafes, shopping malls are packed during Ramadan nights, as we know. Hence the concern that crowded public areas could become the catalysts for super spreader events and lead to rapid coronavirus infection increase. <clears throat> Therefore, it seems that the bottom line is that the authorities must tread a fine line between doing all they can to keep infection rates low whilst allowing a degree of social freedom during Ramadan. Yet according to my respondents, focus groups and interviewees, the onus should not only be on government institutions. The responsibility also lies with individual communities and individuals themselves to maintain coronavirus precautionary measures, such as wearing masks and social distancing in public places to stop the spread of the virus for the benefit of everybody. And on that note, <coughs> I hope <coughs> on that note, I hope that everyone stays safe and well and has a blessed and peaceful Ramadan. Thank you very much and apologies for the internet going off for a minute. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mark. Uh, you've raised some very important points that actually very follow up very nicely on uh, the presentation of Dr. Hintz. However, what I'd like to do now is pivot to um, Zlay's presentation, which is going to, as far as I believe, talk more about Riyadh. So we've been talking a lot about the pandemic uh, and the impact of the pandemic on the city. So I'd like to uh, give the floor to Zlay to talk to us more about the city and potentially uh, link up how these two uh, uh, topics are converging. Zlay. Hello, everyone. Uh, and I'm going to say I'm going to talk about cities in general, uh, specifically city, uh, Saudi cities. Um, um, and um, definitely I will be touching on what have been um, um, uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Hind earlier on. Uh, the importance of public space in cities. Um, also, I will be talking on the history of the response of cities to uh, such pandemics. 
um, and, um, and they want to just conclude with um, a recommendation of what would be uh, a good uh, measures to take uh, moving forward into considering um, uh, the way we redesign or rethink our public spaces and public realm. So I'll share my screen now. Um, um, I don't know if it's allowing me to share, um, the screen, um, it's not showing the screen at all. Um, is there any screen sharing already happening? Uh, Dr. Mark, that. you stop okay. sharing, just making sure. Is it is it not allowing you to screen share at all or? Yeah, it doesn't give me the option to screen share. Um, well, it does uh, screen share, but I cannot choose um, your screen. My screen, exactly. Um, let's see, I can yeah, I can get it from here. So oh, okay, there we go. I think. Sorry. <laughs> so let me try something else. Uh, no, I cancel. Um, let's see if we can. Uh, I think this would be it. Nope, sorry. It's not in the, yeah, okay. Um, how can I share it as a presentation? I think if you begin with the sharing, then you can uh, switch to presentation mode. It was it was quite clear. It looked no 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 no. That's not what I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Wait, <clears throat> I apologize. No problem. Oh. And how do I play it as a presentation? Is it a video or is it a uh, a PowerPoint? PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, if you, you should be able to do presentation mode and then click through it. Uh, and do I do it from the um, sharing the screen or is it something else? If you share screen and then hit presentation mode and then just kind of click through it using your space or your, or your uh, mouse, it should work as a regular presentation. The, the only uh, option I get is um, photo or iCloud Drive, Dropbox, it doesn't really give me the screen, the actual screen sharing. Whiteboard, yeah, that's not what we want. Um, let, me, let me try this. I'll just, I'll just um, flip through it, uh, even though it's not really. <laughs> I mean, you gotta I see do what, what you, you gotta do. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's it, it looks like pages while we're supposed to be like presenting as uh, slides. Um, that's fine. I can deal with that. I think um, it's just I don't want to confuse people. So I'm trying to uh, maybe zoom in a little. Um, so I want to start with saying that cities are human habitat first and foremost. Uh, cities have a very important uh, function as place that catalyze uh, inclusion and innovation by bringing people together. Uh, cities are the most complex human-made systems on Earth. Uh, how we build our cities not only affect the quality of our lives and lifestyle, but can shape the way we live our lives. It can force us to commute long distances. It can provide us the choices available to us. It, de uh, it decides whether we can walk to get uh, daily needs or have to hop in our cars. 
It decides whether our children can play with other children safely in the park or, mostly, or must play in the street. In the modern era, we have planned our cities from the perspective of an airplane. Have you seen the um, 1990 and the 2000 structure plans for uh, many uh, cities in the kingdom? Uh, have you seen the pretty patterns uh, and uh, that look great on paper, uh, but are uh, meaningless when we are walking or driving around the, the ground? In many ways, we have lost the human scale in our cities. Uh, and this makes it uh, hard for us to relate to our cities anymore. The car has taken over as the determinant of the mobility infrastructure with free flow traffic, uh, leading our cities to be shaped for cars and around cars. One has uh, to only look at Dubai to see free flow traffic uh, uh, intersection that are the size of a traditional neighborhood, impossible to cross on foot. This prioritization has led to a lack of choice in mobility, resulting in a car dependency lifestyle. Our public spaces, our public realm, has been more shaped by the car than the people. The third land requirement as set by the law of roads uh, in the, uh, um, and buildings in 1942 might have uh, meant that there was land for streets, footpath, local parks and mosques. But in reality, we were just delivered streets and more streets with no footpath, empty spaces where parks were meant to be but we did get the mosques, which we sometimes have to drive to. It is only more recent. Um, it's only um, recent times that we have uh, seen an effort to uh, building public spaces, but because there is so little of it, uh, most people have to drive to it mostly. Uh, so nobody walks uh, to Wadi Hanifa, but at least when we are there, uh, you get to uh, walk around indefinitely. But public spaces are popular. You only have to visit parks or squares on Thursday's night um, or over the weekend to see how crowded it is in, 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 in favorable weather. Uh, the square outside King Fahad uh, Library, for instance, um, is packed with families, picnicking, children playing and running around and people uh, watching our people, uh, other people. What we are going through now with COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic. Humans and cities are resilient. History has shown, how, shown us this. Cities recovered from the Black Death. Cities recovered from the 1980 Spanish flu pandemic. Cities recovered from the 1957-58 pandemic. Cities will recover from COVID-19. In the late 19th century, we saw two major pandemics, the 1864 uh, cholera pandemic and in the 1889 flu pandemic. These influence significantly infrastructure, interventions in cities, uh, as well as led to the uh, advancement of town planning at the time. In the summer of 1892, Hamburg was yet by uh, the last serious break, uh, breakout of uh, cholera in Western Europe. At the height of outbreak, Robert Koch, head of the state uh, Institute for Infection Diseases, placed the city under quarantine and organized treatment uh, for those uh, infected. Shocked by the poverty and unhealthiness of some qu uh, quarters in the old city, 
Cults led a rethinking of labor conditions and immigrant housing. Between 1860s and 1880, three cities underwent remarkable transformation. Paris was transformed around uh, Ron uh, Hoffman. Barcelona extended following uh, uh, Cardia Plan. And Vienna filled in the former era, era of Wolf Electric Park with uh, possibly the finest streets and collection of buildings uh, in all of Europe. These were also uh, in part responses to the um, rise of diseases and sanitary issues caused by the open air sewage, poor urban accommodation and conjunction of slums. Among other uh, factors following the industrial revolution as shown by Hamburg response uh, likewise at the same time in London, massive public transport, uh, massive, sorry, ma ma massive public uh, infrastructure project were directly addressing the same issue uh, along with uh, uh, the groundbreak public health uh, legislation. It is not just health crisis that have led to transformation moments for cities. Many world leading public uh, transport cities were shocked uh, into the response by the oil crunches in the early 1970s. As many cities around the world have shown qual uh, quality and accessible public spaces suitable for safe distancing uh, has been essential during the pandemic as much uh, for physical health and mental health. The same three cities that are uh, explored from uh, the 19th century are leading with innovative responses now and they have some relevant uh, to Saudi Arabia. We have um, Barcelona and its super blocks, Paris and its 15 minute city, and Vienna uh, uh, speed up its program for green spaces and street uh, closure that will uh, uh, plant everywhere. Many other cities around the world responded uh, in different ways, primarily with temporary street closure and public space uh, intervention. Uh, why, uh, will they uh, become permanent? That we don't know, uh, but there is an opportunity here to be transfor uh, transformative, uh, designing for health and well-being. I'd say health and wealth, uh, health and wealth. We can see that crisis can shape our experiences and our responses, especially at the city level. And we uh, have to be careful about the response. So. We can see that crisis, uh, sorry. Uh, therefore, we need to start first um, by probably uh, rethinking the public space uh, and maybe by starting with public space analysis to inform strategies for uh, transitioning and reopening of public spaces. Also a public space analysis to inform strategies post COVID-19 behavior change. And the questions to be asked, how can we effectively design public spaces that support people where they live? And how can we shift our focus to beyond a properly functional public realm to a quality outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, and interesting, again, to look at cities as a whole. As discussed, a lot of the implications of the pandemic are obviously universal for all cities um, and then contextualized uh, depending on responses uh, and demographics, of course. Uh, we've had a few questions, um, but uh, I would like to um, ask a couple myself first. So one of the first questions I think I wanted to ask had to do a little bit 
um, about kind of the end of the pandemic. We've talked a lot about redesigning um, spaces, internal, external measures uh, that are introduced in order to mitigate some of the fears that were brought up and the psycholo psychological implications of the pandemic. You know, cases are rising. However, um, there have been, uh, you know, low death rates within the kingdom and vaccination rates uh, around the world are starting to pick up. Does that mean that we're going to be able to uh, begin restricting kind of our, uh, our approach to social distancing um, and, and kind of scaling that back and opening up these spaces? Um, or uh, will the pandemic be over when uh, there are zero cases of the coronavirus? Um, and what does that mean for the city's economy? Um, I think maybe we can begin with all the panelists answering this question, maybe with Dr. Hint. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I think uh, our life uh, should go on. And we have to come back to our life. You know, we, we, we have been about one year at home and no one of us is pleased by this situation. Uh, I think we have to come back to our life uh, normally by applying uh, the health procedures, uh, social distancing, wearing the mask and using the sanitizer. Uh, with all the cautions, we have to apply it in everywhere in your office in your home, uh, on the public spaces, when you visit shopping mall or a, a park or anything, even uh, I put everything in my uh, handbags, the small bag. It is going with me everywhere, in your car, on your park, and the office and mall and everywhere. So it, it was like a practice. Mm -hmm. it, it's and do you see like this? So you see this as kind of a long-term uh, yes. approach to life, think, regardless I, of the pandemic. I think I think the situation, uh, you know, it will be extent as uh, as we all listen to the news every mm. day. Uh, it will be extend maybe one year, uh, you know, forward. So we need to uh, practice our life with this situation. You mm. can come back uh, to your uh, office, uh, go to the shopping mall, uh, pray at mosque and uh, visit your neighbors, but uh, make sure that you are applied the health procedures. Thank you. Dr. Mark, what's your response considering your kind of view of the psychological implications of such restrictions? Well, I think, you know, like it, like everything in life, I mean, it, it might, you might be in a negative situation, but you have to see what positives you can take out of it and you have to see what lessons you can learn. Now, I think we've learned a lot of lessons because we've actually seen that infections of other respiratory sort of types of illnesses like flus and colds have actually dropped in a lot of places. So I have friends, for example, in London who sort of say, well, you know, I mean, I'm never going to commute on the train again without wearing a mask. You know, especially in the winter, because, you know, you think about in the past, everybody crammed in together on metros or undergrounds and things like this in the winter. Well, you know, I mean, not not in Asia, of course, because we know in Asia, mask wearing has been something of a norm for a very long time. I know even when I lived in South Korea in the 1990s, you know, mask wearing was common then, even then. So I think we've sort of learned some of those things. So I agree with Dr. Hidden says, you know, maybe we've. You know, maybe this has raised awareness of sort of sort of sort of sort of everyday health precautions and everyday health issues that actually we should be doing anyway. And we should be doing sort of long after, say, COVID has abated, hopefully. Um, and and, and I, I, you know, I think there are things that now that we've started to do that maybe, you know, we, we don't even really think about that we do them anymore. You know, I mentioned going to the gym, for example, that, you know, I take my own towels to the gym every day now. You know, whereas, of course, in the past, that was not something that you did. You got all of those things there. The same with, you know, taking your prayer mat to the mosque and things like this, rather than using communal ones. You know, maybe maybe we've sort of learned these, you know, we're learning these lessons about sort of better sort of health, you know, better sort of health precautions, really. And that in itself will also, you know, help us to 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 sort of to not just sort of, you know, not just deal with COVID, but also deal with all of these other um, you know, flus and colds that are part of our daily lives. Thank you. Lay, what's your take on it? Beyond personal protection equipment and PPE and the masks, from a city perspective, where are we going with this? Uh, well, 
I mean, we have all seen massive efforts uh, in the country and how um, the response was on a very high level, I'd say, compared to other countries. And uh, there was like, um, you know, critical points where things got out of control. But for most of the time, we were actually doing way uh, better than a lot of um, countries um, because of, of the imposed measures, uh, which I think was um, really um, uh, a blessing to, to witness um, because, you know, I mean, we all want to be protecting ourselves. However, um, looking at all of that, that's the health aspect of it. And we always um, um, like focus on, on, on the health part of it, but we um, forget the, um, the actual, like, um, I'd say mental health also yeah. aspect of the, of the whole situation and also mm -hmm. the um, physical health in other parts where it's not about just being um, uh, exposed to a disease or other, but also not being active or not being able yes. to attend to the gym or, 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 or attend to uh, certain physical activities. Um, I think what we have to learn from um, this pandemic is the importance, the real importance of, of public realm and public spaces uh, in cities. Mm -hmm. Um, and how uh, we should take advantage of, of, of this learning into actually uh, putting all um, um, our efforts uh, from now on into providing the best and, 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 and for most, as I said, public spaces uh, that are uh, coming after probably doing some analysis and, and, and to inform strategies to transfer and, uh, and to reopen uh, those places or actually to rethink public spaces post-COVID. Uh, because I've, as I mentioned before, this is not going to be the last pandemic, and we all know it. Um, and I hope that we we learn our lesson and and we move forward, uh, uh, thinking on 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 solutions and how to be a a, a resilient city and resilient uh, citizens as well, and and then people of the country. Thank you. Uh, just another question I have following kind of from this idea of we need to go back to life with new habits. Um, and we know that these habits need to be persistent. There have been so many efforts to um, develop urban spaces, in, especially if we're talking about Riyadh. Uh, the Riyadh season, uh, the Riyadh um, uh, gate, and all of these beautiful spaces have been designed pre-pandemic, they have adapted. However, from Dr. Hen's presentation, we've seen that many people have chosen to kind of stay inside more, go out when they have to, but it's not necessarily their priority. Uh, and so I wonder if any of you have any ideas on how we can bring Rial and the spirits of Rial into the home and what can be done in that space to make sure that the essence of the city isn't lost because of these restrictions. Could I or hint? <laughs> uh, please, Dr. Hint, go ahead. <laughs> uh, for me, I uh, keep watching my children. Uh, sometimes uh, I feel sad for them because they are uh, young. I have uh, three uh, boys, 17, uh, 20, uh, 23, they are young. They need to practice life, you know, to go outside and uh, feel with everything like we lived before. But uh, we need to be, uh, and during COVID-19, uh, so uh, to apply the procedures and uh, to be careful. We have to be careful about uh, the, the COVID-19 virus. And everyone is afraid. You know, if I ask someone to go outside with me, I, for me, I take care about the, applying the procedures. But for them, we need to be sure that, that they apply the procedures. If I ask them to go outside, they never go with me. They are afraid. Really, they are afraid. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to make them uh, feel like, um, uh, uh, don't be afraid. We can practice our life normally. Uh, just be sure that you are applying the health procedures, wear the mask whenever you go, uh, use the sterilizer, and that's it. Now, uh, I, my uh, young son, now he come back to practice the sport. He, he is a, a sportsman, and he uh, feels that he has to go there because he feels sad one year. He's sitting at home, uh, no, no, no practicing anything. 
he just sit at home. So I encourage, keep encourage him, uh, him to go outside. Just uh, apply the health procedures. Now he come back to life. He start to practice uh, the sport uh, by applying the health uh, procedures carefully. And uh, it is going on. The life is going on. Okay. Does anybody have another uh, take on how we can make sure that the spirit of the city isn't lost on this? I, I think it's. I think it's very. I mean, one thing I think is very important. I mean, you know, we sort of mentioned the sort of the well. <clears throat> excuse me. We mentioned the sort of well-known sort of high-profile projects and the parks and the Wadi Hanifas and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but as Leigh pointed out, you know, you you know, you you have to travel to get to these places, you know, and I think what's very important is that, and this is happening in Riyadh, I mean, I, I saw some, play, I was in a, a district I hadn't been to for a while yesterday, and I noticed how the, the sidewalks have been considerably widened there, um, so that people, so that people could you go on, use their bikes, use their roller skates and things like this. So I think it's very important that these spaces are also available in the you know in local spaces not places where you have to travel to you know the where there where where there are community there are more community places more community parks more community outdoor spaces rather than just sort of as we had in the past you know sort of sort of a lot of housing and um, i mean i particularly like the photograph one of the photographs that they showed of the road with the construction down the middle where you can't cross and you know you have to drive two kilometers to do a u-turn to come back to go you know and, and i think we, you know that is very that's not very friendly for people living in those areas so i think it's it's about as well making sure that that you have these spaces you know locally within 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 the housing districts Actually, before we turn to you, Lane, maybe you can comment on that, as well as a question that we received about whether or not you think that neighborhoods um, should have an equal number of residents in each neighbor, and should, should residents be distributed um, kind of equally, would that help the government deal with the spread of cases and with, um, with, the, with the pandemic in a different way? Um, well, um, in terms of like, um, the distribution of residents in neighborhoods, I don't think this is an issue. The issue is how we treat our public realm in those neighborhoods. Um, what are we, what public spaces or what type of public spaces, functional public spaces that we are providing with quality, um, you know, um, uh, design and quality um, um, services that we are providing. Um, I don't see at all that having a certain number of people in such a neighborhood would be an issue. Um, actually, um, especially in Saudi Arabia, this won't be an issue. I think for the next hundred years, we have uh, expanded our cities and, and we have already have spread uh, 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 city, uh, I'd say, um, uh, planning approach. Uh, so that won't be an issue. Our issue really is how do we start thinking seriously on day-to-day -day life? Uh, how do we approach it? How do we rethink the zoning? How do we rethink the um, the uh, regulations and, and policies? And how do we um, uh, put, I mean, there are amazing projects that are happening in Riyadh since we are talking about Riyadh itself. But when I see, uh, or when I say projects, I'm not talking so much of a Riyadh season and other, because these are mostly events, I would call them, than they are uh, projects. And um, I love uh, I love initiatives uh, more than projects I would say. But again, projects are also have a very big impact. Like uh, King Salman Park, a large yeah. park that is the what is it five they said or six times the Central Park in New York or so. Um, that is also uh, strategically placed in, 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 in or, or chosen as a, as a, as where it goes in in, in the city where it spans from um, different uh, prospect of neighborhoods, um, different uh, level of, of, of um, or classes, uh, I'd say life classes or, or, or um, um, different people with backgrounds as well uh, from uh, neighborhoods that are known for being, uh, um, for expats or, or neighborhoods that are uh, purely uh, rich Saudis or the middle class or different classes in general. Uh, because of its size and because of its placement in the middle of the city. Um, Sports Boulevard would definitely also help um, on, on enhancing uh, livability. 
uh, the greening Riyadh will, will help in sustainability and enhancing livability. But all of these are projects, very important projects, but not as important as, as big initiatives, initiatives that take over the whole city, initiatives that rethink streets in general. Uh, that any street that need to be reconstructed need to be reconstructed in in a certain way. Public spaces that need to be um, uh, built or designed that has to have a minimum requirement to ensure quality of these public spaces and how much services uh, that will be provided uh, to the citizens. The rethinking of 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 uh, like the coding, let's say, and the uh, regulations, uh, and again the zoning uh, on these uh, neighborhoods. Um, and that would then give us the um, day-to-day -day, uh, walkable city where we can actually um, walk from our houses to do things um, around the day and not to go to places where we get the opportunity to, talk, uh, to walk then. Um, and this definitely is not just a, a change on, on lifestyle uh, only or just a project or it, it's also a whole change of a mindset of how do we approach our uh, design on cities and public spaces. Thank you. We have another question, which is about spaces. So a couple of the spaces that were mentioned in uh, Dr. Hens' research, mosques and malls, uh, have, you know, they attract a large uh, percentage of the population. But in general, can we identify one or two spaces uh, that if we needed to restrict more, uh, would really kind of be the silver bullet? Let's do restrict these three types of venues, for instance, where the majority of uh, the citizens are flocking to, and in that way we can curb the spread of the pandemic and then potentially uh, deal with it better. Do you have a, an idea of which, which ones would be the easy targets in terms of, in terms of urban spaces? Yes. In, uh, in the mosque, regarding the mosque, uh, usually in Saudi Arabia, in neighborhood, we have a small mosque. Uh, during this COVID-19, I don't think, and this is my uh, opinion, uh, this small mosque can be open for public because if you make some uh, cautions or some uh, uh, strategies for, uh, for area, uh, how many people can enter per area, it will be like 20 or less. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe 10, 10 persons if you apply the social distancing. It is, it is not uh, any effective uh, number. So in this situation, I encourage to open the large mosque, large mosque uh, with the, the large areas to encourage people uh, to pray. And uh, with applying the social distancing, the effective number maybe uh, reach 40 uh, or more according to the uh, space area. Uh, uh, in uh, Eid, Eid al-Adha, Eid uh, uh, al-Fitr, because uh, so many people like to pray at the morning, uh, this uh, special occasion for uh, Muslims, uh, I think we can use the public space, uh, the open, open uh, space at the middle of the uh, neighborhood. It is better for the situation of COVID-19. Thank you. I'm very conscious of time. We only have a couple of minutes left. So Dr. Mark, did you have a, a response to this? I mean, I'm... Personally, I'm not always terribly comfortable with going to some of the um, very fashionable malls at the moment that have sort of opened recently, uh, certainly at, at certain times in particular, because they are, you know, they are quite crowded, um, particularly with younger people. Um, I mean, maybe that's because I'm older as well, <laughs> anyway. But um, but no, I mean, I I mean, I I do like the idea of. You know when Tawakalna work, you know, working for you know the fact that you have to check in and check out that there are, that, you know, that there are limits for the numbers of people that are allowed into places. I think that is a good idea, and I think that's something that uh, certainly in in places, as I said, places maybe like gyms as well. You know, I think that's very important. Excellent. Okay, in the last thirty seconds, uh, I'd like you each to comment on uh, your point of view in terms of where you see Riyadh going in the next three years um, and uh, in light of the pandemic and in light of coming out of the pandemic. Olay, let's start with you. Okay, uh, well, I'm, I'm really hopeful uh, of the future of the city. I think we have seen the initiatives and the big projects and the way uh, things are, are taking over. 
And we all also heard uh, His Royal Highness uh, speech on Riyadh um, not long ago. It was only three months ago. And that how the strategy uh, of the city would really um, rethink um, the whole uh, uh, approach on, on planning and urban design. Uh, so I'm very, very hopeful. Um, and I think if we are very uh, cautious and, and, and very uh, strategic in terms of uh, really looking at the pandemic, and, and considering taking serious measures and planning uh, moving forward, um, that would be um, um, a great thing to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Hent? Uh, in my opinion, it will be more a uh, healthy city, Riyadh, because uh, the government uh, is aware about the situation and they apply mm -hmm. the cautions and uh, uh, health procedures and everything mm -hmm. is going good uh, in the community here. Uh, mm -hmm. It will be more healthy, and uh, I think uh, the COVID-19 in uh, Riyadh City and Saudi Arabia will disappear soon. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mark? Well, I, as I said in my presentation, I think that something that's extremely important is that the Saudi government has been ahead of the curve, you know, right from the beginning. And that has really made a difference. Riyadh is a very vibrant city. Um, that's why I love it. It's it's becoming increasingly vibrant. It's, it's obviously, you know, it's a young city in many ways as well. And so there is, I think there's optimism. I'm optimistic. Uh, and I think, I think, you know, I think there's challenges, of course there's challenges, but I think those challenges can be overcome. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot to hope for. I think there is a lot more to discuss as well, but unfortunately we yes. have run out of time this evening. <laughs> so I would like to thank our esteemed panelists uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you to Darul Ulum in co-hosting this event uh, with the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. And just to echo Dr. Mark, I wish you all Ramadan Kareem and a very safe uh, and healthy Ramadan going forward.